I mentioned yesterday that our view of the world is often culturally tainted, um, or at least culturally influenced to the point where it may be difficult for us to see beyond the cultural influence in our epistemology. I mentioned my own background, um, Irish, and I said that that's probably the case in my way of seeing things, and I just contrasted that somewhat in a caricaturish kind of way with people that would presumably think differently. Uh, I mentioned I'm from the, or I'm not from the south of Ireland, I'm from the east of, the, of Canada, but um, my background originates there, and that could mean why I find it so natural to waffle and obfuscate, or not even obfuscate, I guess, just to live in the gray zone, the gray area. It doesn't particularly bother me. Um, whereas, say, somebody of a particularly practical bent, and I just use, you know, the, the stereotypical practical peoples uh, that I am aware of, the Ulstermen or uh, the Scots are essentially the same, uh, the same way. Um, one could just as easily say, I don't know, the Germans or something like that, where, you know, things are the way they are, and that's that. Um, no nuance. No nuance is required. You, you know, shoes are shoes and clothes are what you wear type thing. Um, <clears throat> but those are cultural as much as they are epistemological. What do you go looking for when you go looking for truth? Some people go looking for a confirmation of what they already quote-unquote know or what they believe. And really, I, I'm not really sure that that's really a, a faulty way of finding the truth. The only thing is you'll only find your own truth that way. <laughs> or a truth that you choose to subscribe to, whether or not you realize it, that you're actually choosing. Um, now, <clears throat> that is um, an example that's, you know, with the ethnic conflicts or the, I don't know what you call it, not really ethnic conflicts, but the sectarian conflicts in Northern Ireland, it kind of, you know, lets you know that at least that's a that's a conflict that somehow I don't know it comes from somewhere because you've got two different mindsets colliding in one part of the UK, uh, which you may or may may or may not have. But you know, it just sort of when you see two people, two two groups fighting each other, you sort of say, okay, there's got to be a reason for this, and that's you know that's one explanation for it. Um, there's a zillion explanations for it, it um, but uh, that's one now. That, I thought, would be a particularly obvious one. Um, but it, in many ways, it's only obvious to those who understand it from inside. In other words, I understand the enormous difference between a Catholic and a Protestant Irishman. Um, even when an outsider, a third party or whatever, wouldn't really get it. They wouldn't really see the difference. Um, there's a bigger uh, or better example of this in the Balkans, or in East Central Europe in general, I guess I'd call it, not necessarily the Balkans. And it's got to do with something called ethnic truth. Now, this is not a, um, an idea that has come about um, as a result of uh, introspection by the people from Southeastern Europe, or, or of East Central Europe. Uh, it's, it was basically a, an idea that was sort of coined by, I think it was an English um, writer in the 19th century, to describe what visitors to Greece in particular at the time uh, found absolutely baffling. <clears throat> Where the average Greek person, um, quote unquote, knew, and, and I hesitate to even say quote unquote, but um, the mindset is so constructed that that person, by virtue of being born into a group that identifies itself as Greeks and, you know, we are this ethnicity, is automatically the heir to everything in ancient Greece and, say, the Byzantine Empire and all kinds of other things that are, you know, make being Greek somehow special. Automatically by being a member of the Greek nation, ethnicity, tribe, whatever you want to call it. It automatically means that you have a claim to that narrative, that you are the heir in a small way to Alexander the Great, 
to Socrates, to Plato, um, to the you know the glories of the Byzantines and all that kind of thing. And the corollary to that is, of course, that your neighbors are not. <laughs> um, there's a squabble right now that comes and goes between the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and the Hellenic Republic, where they get into pretty vicious fights over the name of Macedonia and what Alexander the Great's ethnicity was. Now, you look at that and you say, that is crazy. This guy lived 2,500 years ago, and there are people willing to start killing each other over this issue. Now, it's almost impossible to, if you're not, if you haven't studied it, to get into the strength of feeling that exists there. You have to sort of look back about, uh, I guess, to say, you know, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia to understand, or at least somehow measure, I guess, the depth of ethnic rivalries in that part of the world. Um, they're fierce everywhere in the world, but it's sort of legendary, the ethnic rivalries in East Central Europe. Um, and you see what underpins it. You see that, like, from the outside, the Western world was more or less taken completely by surprise by the breakup of Yugoslavia. They simply couldn't believe that people would turn on each other like that. Um, <clears throat> but if you understand the way that they see history, ethnic history. You ask, say, a Serb nationalist, or, you know, a hypothetical Serbian nationalist, an ultra-nationalist, I guess, and he may actually sincerely believe that civilization was essentially invented by Serbians. That, say, I don't know, the, uh, the original Aryans were Serbians, the, um, the ancient Greeks and Romans were Serbians, um, everything wonderful was invented by a Serb, etc., etc. Now, that, that's kind of a caricature of the whole thing. Um, but when you look into the mindset that surrounds ethnicity in East Central Europe, you're dealing with something that is almost alien to the Western mind. Um, this sort of ethnic pride that goes back thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> and in particular, it, it's, it's known as a nationalist conception of history that trumps inconvenient facts. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter that, say, in the 19th century, the Kingdom of Greece was corrupt, weak, backward, um, chaotic, unsafe, poor, all that kind of thing. Um, we are the heirs of the ancient Greeks. Therefore, we are a sublime people. We are wonderful. We are better than our neighbors. Uh, we maybe even be the best in the world, depending on who you ask, uh, simply because we are who we are and we don't have to actually do anything to prove ourselves anymore. It's all our narrative means we are automatically the people who are fabulous. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't mean this to insult the peoples of East Central Europe or Southeastern Europe. It's more of, I guess, I'm trying to point out that epistemology itself has to start somewhere and you don't necessarily usually know where you're starting. It's hard to say where your relative position is to everything before you even start to analyze yourself. You just got to say, okay, what am I and let's look at where I even begin to analyze myself. How does a person in East Central Europe do that? Well, there's a good chance, or you know, there is a chance that that person might self-identify as a participant in a national narrative that goes back to the beginnings of recorded history. Such things actually exist, particularly, say, in Greece or in, oh, I don't know, I guess uh, any, any country that has sort of some sort of connection with classical antiquity. Um, they often do actually believe that they are the people who invented civilization, but that goes for all the ethnicities down there. You'll find Albanians or um, Turks or, you know, Bulgarians or whatever that honestly believe that they are something akin to the chosen people. Um, and this is the 
starting point with which they start to, with which they build their epistemology. This is the very beginning of how they see reality itself. Um, it's a very difficult concept to get across to people that aren't familiar with it. Um, and it's not, I'm not trying to say that these people are stupid or crazy because they believe this. It's just that's the universe, that's the cultural universe in which people form their opinions of the world. Um, that's why, you know, they do, you know, words, words like balkanized or when you say Balkan conflict, you, you tend to see a horrific conflict of everybody on one side against everybody on the other. It's, it's the entire population of one ethnic group or self-identified ethnic group against the entire population. And the, the, the conflicts are ferocious. We know this. Um, and you sort of look at that and you go, they're just nuts down there. But no, they're not. They just have a different conception of what history actually is. History is almost tangibly real in that part of the world. There are quarrels in which the, the that in which intelligent, educated, urbane people in both sides, say, in the conflict over Macedonia, in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and in the Hellenic Republic, they insist that one side is stealing its history, that the other side is stealing our history. A Macedonian will say, Alexander the Great was Macedonian, and if you say that he's Greek, then you're stealing from my history. You're taking things from my narrative and you're putting it in yours, and that's garbage, and I'm not going to tolerate that. In fact, I'm going to get really angry, and this could even lead to war. That sounds crazy, but it's not. It, you just have to understand how these people form their view of reality itself. The whole ethnic truth thing kind of is a difficult thing to explain simply because it makes, you know, it, 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 it basically says that people believe things that anyone outside of the region considers insane, but to them it's reality. The best example that I have of a, of a recent one, and I'll try and find a link and link it below, is once the Pope visited Greece, I think it was in 2001, and he visits Greece and there's all these demonstrations by Orthodox, Greek Orthodox clergy against the Pope because of the Third Crusade, I believe it was, when the Crusaders sacked Constantinople. Now if you look, if you, if you introduce that idea to say a Filipino Catholic or a Peruvian Catholic or um, I don't know, a, um, uh, any, any, most Catholics in the world, they simply wouldn't understand that. They would say, why are you protesting the Pope over something that happened a thousand years ago? That doesn't make sense. The Crusaders acting on the behest of the Pope sacked Constantinople, hastening or precipitating the downfall of the Byzantine Empire. Therefore, it makes sense that each of our respective ancestors, that when, or each of our, yeah, it makes sense now that we as, say, Greeks, would still understand that the Pope, the present Pope, has wronged us personally because he wronged our ancestors. Even if it's a thousand years ago, it doesn't matter. Um, the narrative says that what he did was wrong, therefore his descendants or the descendants of that group that did that to our group are still in debt to us for something bad that they've done. As I say, you, 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 you bring that to say a Filipino who goes to church every Sunday, a Catholic church and is very Catholic and everything, he simply would not be able to understand that. It, it would be beyond the capacity of his mind to, to, to cope with that situation. He probably doesn't even know where Constantinople is. He's never heard of the Third Crusade. He doesn't know about, he probably doesn't even know what Eastern Orthodoxy is. But here he sees the Pope visiting another country and he's being um, denounced by priests, nuns, and intelligent people, educated people, for what happened a thousand years ago. And these are not stupid people who are doing this, by the way. If you actually spoke to them, it's just, that's, that's the epistemology that, they, that they're working with. Ethnicity 
and history and the, the, the intersection of the two is tangibly real. The past might as well have been yesterday. In fact, the past is happening right now. Um, you know, some Greeks would say that Constantinople is falling right now. Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, this is coming back in, in, in the West, actually, in our relationship to the Islamic world. You know, the gates of Vienna is coming up and, you know, the, all this way in which the, the Islamic world has attempted to inundate the West before is brought up. But in Southeastern Europe especially, or in East Central Europe generally, Everybody seems to, every ethnicity has at least a constituency in itself that sees reality itself that way. How would you crack that? Well, most people would say, I wouldn't even try to get past ethnic truth. It's just insanity. Um, it's just crazy, and there's just no point in trying to deal with any of that. They're just wrong. All right, but they still believe that. And if you want to say that they're wrong, you're going to have to put forward a case as to why they are wrong. Um, but you, when you start doing that, you discover that the very basic building blocks of their actual epistemology is utterly different from yours. Nationalism gets into that. It gets into ontology. Essentially, it's that strong. Um, and my name actually brought up this issue of um, how ethnicity informs truth or in, informs our view of the truth. And I was fascinated by that. Um, and it, it brought back that memory of, the, uh, of the, uh, the newspaper article I had read in 2001. And it brought back this, you know, a period of interest I had in the Yugoslav or the ex-Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia's quarrel with the Hellenic Republic, Greece and how that fascinated me and how it, it, um, it dealt extensively with that phenomenon known as ethnic truth. Um, I like to use the Irish as a good example of that kind of thing, but in, in Southeastern Europe, it's even more pronounced and more obvious. And anyone who's ever encountered that kind of thing is encountering a view of reality that is remarkably different from ours. And what's all the more interesting is, if you say to go to Bulgaria, or if you go to, um, I don't know, uh, Serbia, or Montenegro, Greece, something like that, Turkey, you say people that aren't really all that different from us. They're kind of Western in the way that they think, look, everything like that, but you get into the ethnic stuff. And the, the situation could change. I won't say that every Greek is an ultranationalist, that's wrong, but there's a critical mass in each country that is like this. And these are not crazy people. <laughs> um, these are people that, you know, have thought this through, and they tend to just sort of see their ethnicity as more important than anything else in, in, in reality. <laughs> um, and how that informs an epistemology and, uh, epistemology and a truth is something I find extremely fascinating, and it... Um, it's quite a challenge to get some to 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 see if you can actually crack that, if you can somehow challenge that successfully, even in your own head, um, to sort of say, okay, I can come up with an argument by which I can refute, say, a Serbian ultranationalist's idea that the Serbs created civilization. Okay, so I can refute that, but now how am I going to bring that to a Serbian nationalist and say? Well, I take exception to what you're saying, and these are the reasons why. Um, what you find is the, the, the nationalistic sort of view of history, the ethnic truth of it, goes back far deeper than you thought it did. And <clears throat> it's a lot bigger of a, it's a lot larger of a task to get through to, or to, to deal with that thing, ethnic truth, than you realized. And it forces you to challenge your own ideas of ethnicity and national pride and everything like that. Uh, even the fact that you like your own background. I like to think of myself as unnationalistic. In fact, I'm anti-nationalistic. But I don't know. I kind of like being Irish, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you, you know, you, you you end up looking at your own history again that way, and it, it isn't really my own 
my own history or anything. It's just, you know, my own sort of alter ego, which is somehow, you know, in a pleasant kind of harmless kind of way built into being Irish, etc., etc. Why should I feel any pride over it? I don't know, but I do. Um, or not pride, but just, I don't know, I feel good about it. Okay, does that make sense? Not really, because I didn't have anything to do with it. You know, the potato famine. I didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, how the Irish saved civilization or anything like this. It's nothing to do with me at all. Um, you know, I'm just some guy that was born in Canada and raised being told by other people what he was. And okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but it's an interesting view of epistemology. It's an, it's an interesting look into another epistemology from that comes from people that are quite similar to us in some ways, but radically different in others. Uh, this video has become quite a ramble, unfortunately, but I'm going to upload it anyway and, uh, and see where it goes. But this ethnic truth business is something that I find um, really fascinating, and especially on a sort of an, when you're, even when you're talking about epistemology and even ontology. Um, None of that stuff really exists except for inside the human mind, as I always say, and the human mind is malleable. Um, and I like finding these enormous divides between ethnicities, if you want to call it that, or I would even call it just narratives. Um, how, how truth gets formulated. Uh, in a society or in a group or even in an individual or within a family or something like that. Our people have always suffered at the hands of those bastards in the other valley and um, they're evil people and we're good people and meanwhile somebody else is telling their kids the same story in the other valley about me. Um, first glance you look at the Balkans and you say they're all insane. Very simple. Simple um, explanation to all that. They're crazy. Lunatics. But it's not that simple. <laughs> um, there is a mindset that exists and isn't going anywhere, at least not quickly, uh, that is quite different from the Western one, even though in so many other ways they're very similar to us. 